My name is James McLashen. I'm here with the Gaelic American. I'm joined by John Crowley, author of The Yank. My life is a former U.S. Marine in the IRA. So John, thanks for sitting down with us today. Thanks, James. Pleasure to be here. Uh, my first question for you today is, can you tell us where you're from and what your upbringing was like? Well, I was born in the United States. I was born in May 1957 in Long Island, New York. I was born to Irish immigrant parents. My father was from County Roscommon. My mother was from County Kerry. Um, when I was born, my father was actually in the United States Air Force at the time. He had joined the American Air Force for a four-year stint to get technical training and also to accelerate American citizenship, which you could do at the time. Uh, when I was about two, we came to Ireland for the first time, but just for a summer. And my earliest memory is actually of Ireland, being on the tractor with my uncle. Uh, we went back to the States. Uh, I was raised in Chicago. I don't remember New York because I left so young. So I was raised in Chicago. And when I was 13, I came home for a summer in Ireland for the full summer. And then when I was 14, we came home to Ireland to live. And I lived in Roscommon for the first year with an aunt. Went to school there, the same school that my father had gone to with some of the same teachers. And then we moved to Dublin. And uh, just before my 18th birthday, I left to join the United States Marine Corps with the intention of coming home someday and joining the Irish Republican Army. And it was a... Um, it was, a, it, it was uh, a decision brought on by my own self-awareness, my, my own education. I didn't really know any Republicans. I don't come from a Republican background. I had no mentor or any person that was advising me on this. Or, In other words, I heard no IRA propaganda. It was simply my own decision based upon my belief systems and upon uh, my own personal motivation to fight for the full freedom and independence of Ireland. And can you identify anything in particular that made you identify with Irish organism? It's, it's hard to identify a particular thing. It was, it was a natural sympathy, but I think it was very much encouraged by my upbringing in the United States, which is a republic. And every morning, you know, we used to say the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. And, you know, there's words in that that resonated with me my whole life as a republican. The republic for which it stands one nation indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I mean, they form the basis of much of my belief system in life. The uh, United States was um, a nation of nations. Uh, you know, you had your Italian neighborhoods, your Irish neighborhoods, you had your African American, you had your, your culture, you had your various ethnic, uh, uh, you know, identities and diversity. but. As the American uh, motto says, e pluribus unum from many one, you had, from many one, you had one overarching uh, loyalty to the, uh, to the American Republic. And I was always a firm believer that there should be, whatever the cultural diversity and ethnic diversities in Ireland, there should be one loyalty to an Irish Republic. In other words, I wanted to see a national democracy within an all-Ireland Republic, and the Brits were stopping that from happening. I see. So throughout your time in the U.S. Marine Corps, you must have been very seriously committed to your idea of joining the Irish Falcon Army after four years in Special Forces. Um, so you, you go through with that, and then the day of your deploy, sorry, the day of your discharge, you fly back to Ireland, and uh, you make your way into the Republican movement. Yes, I was in Marine Recon, and um, I was an instructor in that, and uh, I made sergeant in three years. I had all, I think, almost all were meritorious promotions before my time, and I was given, uh, I was given several. Uh, uh, enticing offers. One was to go to the Presidio in Monterey, California and learn Chinese. And it was specifically said to me that I could get a job in, with the Intel American intelligence community when I left the Marines, you know, as a career. And I was also given the opportunity uh, to go to Annapolis, the Naval Academy. And, uh, but I didn't want to make the American military my career. I was determined to come home. And that, that's what I did. And I know sometimes people will often say to me, you know, you passed up you know, some really great opportunities in life, but for me, the greatest opportunity and the greatest honor in my life was to have been an IRA volunteer. And did you find that uh, the IRA was skeptical about what led an American into their ranks? At the beginning, uh, naturally, and uh, if I was in their shoes, I would have been too. But, you know, the thing is, you know, somebody like my background coming along, you know, you, you'd be inclined to wonder, was this person an adventurer? Uh, or somebody sniffing for a war? Was this person somebody looking for a sense of purpose? But I was somebody with a sense of purpose. I had a strong belief in, in the Irish Republic, and uh, I was determined to join. And I, and I think 
uh, in time after interviews with different people in the IRA and after checking out my background, I, I believe that he came to um, accept my sincerity and I eventually ended up as a volunteer. And so after some time spent as a volunteer here in Ireland, you, uh, you were sent over to the, to the United States to help the gun running network. Yes, I was, I was surprised about that because when I first joined the IRA, I didn't, I didn't join the Marines to join the IRA with some idea of professionalizing the IRA. I really believed the IRA was this professional, sophisticated force I kept hearing about. But I, I only realized maybe after that I kept hearing about it from the British. It was the, it, the IRA weren't saying that. It was the British who were constantly saying, this is the most professional, this is the, you know, the deadliest uh, uh, threat to British rule in Ireland, that this is the, um, the you know, the, the, one of the premier guerrilla groups in the world. And it was only when I joined, uh, I did find fantastic men and fantastic volunteers, but on the whole, it was very amateurish. Uh, I, I found training was very bad. I found that um, uh, there was a lot to be desired. And when I brought some of my concerns up, because most of the stuff I saw was was, was very fixable. It, it was very, it, it, there was no need for it. For example, uh, if you bring men, men in, to a, to a place to train them. It's as easy to do it the right way as the wrong way. It takes the same amount of time, it's the same expense, it's the same logistical effort, everything is the same. To do it right as to do it wrong. Also procuring arms. If you're gonna go in and purchase arms, it's as easy to get the right arms as the wrong arms. So I was very frustrated by this, and when I mentioned this to various members of the area leadership, I, I was very surprised to learn that I had a sense that I was annoying them, that I was bothering them, and that they didn't want to hear any of this. And um, I was actually sent to the States to buy arms, but I was never even told what arms to get, which surprised me as well, because I thought maybe there was a strategy and they would, they would arm for the strategy, but not at all. So I suppose what surprised me most of all was having come as a former Marine Recon instructor, that the only asset that, uh, Martin McGinnis was the man who sent me, but the only asset that Mark McGinnis felt that I had to contribute to the struggle was my accent. He said, you have an American accent, you can walk in the gun stores. And at first I didn't want to go because I said, there's loads of guys over there American accents can do the exact same thing. And I think I can contribute more to you know, our efforts at home. But uh, he was having none of it. And uh, I was more or less given the option to either go or you know, you're out of the IRA. I didn't want to leave the IRA, so I went to the States. Yeah. And in the United States, uh, the Boston Mobster famously helped the IRA with gun running, and you were one of the guys that helped make that connection happen. Yes. Uh, I have to emphasize now, sometimes I see in reports, you know, Martin McGinnis sent me to work for Whitey Bulger. Martin McGinnis did not send me to work for Whitey Bulger. Martin McGinnis did not know Whitey Bulger, never met him in his life. And neither did I. I had no idea who Whitey Bulger was. I was given half a $5 note, and I was told to meet uh, an Irish contact in Boston. He had the other half of the note, so we knew that we were the right people. And it was him who introduced me to Jim Bolger. Now, I, I wasn't from Boston. I'm no uh, expert or authority in organized crime. I'd never heard of this guy in my life. And um, it's, I think it's amazing now, but it's, I suppose it's understandable. With all the movies about him, the books about him, and all that's out about him now that people would sometimes say, well, you must have known who this guy was. I didn't know who he was. I knew, it was clear to me that he was involved in some sort of organized crime. Uh, we. Well, one thing is we would not have worked with drug dealers, and I knew that, and he actually boasted to me that he kept drugs out of Boston. I had no reason not to believe that, and I never saw drugs or anything like that. I wasn't 100% sure what he was involved in, but I got the impression that they had robbed banks in the past, that they talked about that. Actually, he'd done time in Alcatraz for robbing a bank. And also, but I think the main thing that I had the impression they were involved in was like gambling and things like that. So, um, some of the more nefarious activities that we know now he was involved in, he wasn't telling us that. So he seemed like a guy who, who would bend the rules and you know, we needed false ID and to buy guns and we need some, that was illegal, so we needed somebody who was willing to carry out illegal, illegal activity. Uh, Whitey gave the nod, but the, the, the main man over there who was helping us was Pat May. He was another former US Marine. And uh, so we had that connection. And uh, Pat had a genuine interest and involvement in what we were doing. Like Pat's heart was definitely in the right place, whereas Whitey, I could never really discern his motives. We never really discussed it, but I think he liked to think 
people would you know, know he was helping the IRA. And he may have had some ulterior motive down the line. He may have saw something in it for him. But there never would have been. Like, the IRA wasn't going to give, you know, anything to Ray Bolger. Like, right. But, um, you know, we never crossed that Rubicon because I was arrested before that ever came up. You know, because I just had the impression of why he, he wasn't the type of guy that was going to help you and not get something in return. Mm -hmm. But there was nothing, like they say in the book, there's nothing we would do or could do for the guys. So at some stage, that was going to come to a head. But uh, in the meantime, yeah, uh, Whitey wasn't hands-on. As Pat, Pat made all the hands-on work and all the heavy lifting. Whitey just approved it. But I think also, too, it wasn't even so much that Whitey was that sympathetic to the IRA, but I also had the impression that he had to let Pat May and a few others do this because they really wanted to do it. I don't think he wanted to alienate them too much and stop them doing from something they wanted to do. Right. But I also don't think, sorry, that he ever thought it would get as big as it would. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you're also setting up your own network all across the states. Did you find much of a substantial Irish American support network? The, the, there was a large Irish American support network, and you know the Irish government and uh, Irish organizations are constantly trying to downplay that. They're constantly trying to downplay it. But I found, you know, that there was. But because I was supposed to set up a new new network, uh, that was quite difficult making new contacts. But I found some of the best people. Uh, well, you know, some of the best people came from all walks of life. But you know, there was an awful lot of Republicans who went to America after the Civil War. And them and, and their families were some of our staunchest supporters. And not only did they have a, a, a visceral dislike of the Brits, but they absolutely hated the Free State to an extent that I found, you know, almost hard to um, hard 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 to understand. But I understand it better now when I see the bitterness and the split now with Sinn Fein, who have gone, you know, over to the saying the royal family are going to pave the way to Irish unity. And for example, Republicans who still believe in the Republic. And the bitterness there, now it's not a bitterness that's going to lead to bloodshed or nothing like that, but it's a real bitterness. And I can understand the Civil War bitterness a little bit better now, because people who were former comrades of you, who you thought and believed were on the same page as you, and who you firmly believe were on the same mission of you as you, when certain inducements were came in and certain temptations were brought in, they went off on a different path. Right. Yeah. And can you tell us about, uh, you amassed this uh, cache of weapons that you're bringing over to... Arnold, can you tell us about your arrest off the coast, Yeah, well, we uh, we left we left the coast of America, and once we were outside American territorial waters, I was quite confident we were going to make it the whole way, because I was never concerned about being arrested in the Irish, and never for a moment. I was told before I left by members of the IRA leadership that only six or seven men on, on that end knew, and if we got caught, it would be down to me for trusting the wrong person or making some mistake, so it couldn't be their fault. And uh, once we left American territory waters, I was quite convinced that was us. And um, we hit a hurricane halfway across the Atlantic. I described it in the book. It was a horrendous experience. We got through it, and uh, we met up with the Marina Anna, 200 miles off the coast of Ireland, in a place called the Porcupine Basin. Now, I didn't know who was coming to meet us. I was given a longitude and latitude to be at a certain time. Well, the captain was. We were there, we met the boat. I didn't know the Marina Anne, I didn't know even where out of Ireland it had come. For all I knew, we could have been landing the guns in Donegal, Sligo, Galway, Waterford. I had no idea. But uh, I noted that when we were going to Canmare Bay, which is where we were going to offload the guns, which I didn't know about, that the Irish Navy were hiding behind the Skellic Rocks so that the radar from the Marina Anne couldn't detect them. So, as I've, as I, as I've said in the book, you know, uh, the Irish Navy knew we were going to Canmare Bay. I didn't know we were going there, so and I know I didn't tell them. So the problem was on the, the Irish end. Right. Yeah. And after your arrest, you know, you're coming from America where you have a sense of trial by jury and yeah. and that sort of thing. Uh, were you surprised to find that you were tried in a journalist court in Ireland? I wasn't surprised because I knew all about the special criminal court and I knew the different courts in the north had one judge, very often a very often a former British military officer. Uh, but yeah, we were brought up to the court, the special criminal court. There were three judges. Uh, one main main judge and the other two were kind of doddering half retired fellas one of them practically slept through the whole trial no jury uh anything the guards said the guard you know the guard should the Irish police said was taken as gospel absolute gospel and uh our republicans word carried no weight in that court at all which is why it was set up it was really they call it a court but it was really a sentencing tribunal now we were caught red-handed we, we were doing what we were charged with, but many Republicans in, in the past 
were in jail because they were they were verbal in other words verbal statements were put in their mouths by the guards that they never made and uh, there was a lot of fellows in Port Leash who actually were innocent of what they were in there for but guards claimed in front of this court that they made statements they never made and they got many years in prison and uh, that, that, that was that was how that was how the, you know it was it was a, it was really a sentencing tribunal more than a more right. than a, 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 a trial as an American would understand that a trial. And so you served ten years for that offense. Yeah. In 1996, just two years after your release, you were arrested in one of the most audacious attempts to attack the British mainland. You know, what do you think would have been the effect of that attack had your team not been captured? Well, the, well, we were going to attack the the power grid of the south, southeast of England, and um, uh, it was our defense. It was a hoax attack to put it out for. A, a few days or a week, it would still cost them hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, because London alone has like 25, 20, 26 percent of the, of the gross domestic, domestic product of the United Kingdom. So shutting that down for any length of time would cause them natural. It, it was a financial target. It was an economic target against the British state. For, you know, you know, to save them basically. You know, staying in Ireland is going to cost you, and it's going to cost you big. But it was certainly not directly against civilians. Um, uh, but um, their contention was that we intended to blow it up for uh, use explosives. But they see, they actually never actually arrest us with explosives or weapons. Uh, so we were charged with conspiracy, conspiracy to cause explosions, even though we had no explosives with us, and uh, we were given 35 years. But we had a jury trial there. But you know, if you're an IRA man in front of an English jury, you don't have much hope anyway. So even though we had no explosives, they were banking on prejudice of an English jury to convict us, which they did. I know, yeah. But um, uh, regardless of whether our contention it was a hoax or their contention it was it was the real thing, um, and I'm, I'm not going to go beyond that because that's the way the trial was conducted. But the reality of it is closing down the grid in the southeast of England would have been a major, major, major um, setback to the you know the British economy. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you're released in 2000 after the Good Friday Agreement. Yeah. Uh, now your story, it, uh, it reminds me of John Kilgallen, who was also called the Yank by his comrades. He was from Rockwood Beach, New York, and he fought in Easter Rise in 1916. Um, despite that, you know, the two of you guys are emblematic of Irish American nationalism. Uh, why do you think that your story is being ignored by the Irish American press? Well, it's, it, it's getting so much. I, I, I had a pretty good article in the Boston Globe last week by Kevin Cullen, and um, the New York Daily News did a full page in it. But the book's not out that long, so I don't think it's getting that much traction yet. And, you know, there is some talk. Uh, there's at least three producers, one are an Oscar winning producer, are discussing film rights. So maybe it'll get more news and more traction then. But, you know, um, I couldn't really say why that would be in, in, in the press. But in the Irish American press, uh, I know that Sinn Fein control a lot of it. So that because my, my book is critical of the direction they took, uh, I'm quite sure that they will do everything they can to downplay it or ignore it if they possibly can. I think it's a shame. Well, John, thanks for sitting us today. Uh, we're in favor of freedom of speech and classical Republican principles, so we're happy to have you on. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks, James. Thanks very much.